And notice that the straying sheep was a member of the 99 righteous sheep before he strayed away. There's no way we can come to this text and say, well, he was a pseudo sheep. (laughs) He was a just pretend sheep. He was a false professor sheep. He wasn't any of those things. Jesus himself tells us he was a part of the flock and he strayed away. Do born-again Christians ever drift away from the flock? No. No pastor, none of you pastors have ever had that experience where one of your sheep strayed away, did you? Never, never happens. And how about the parable of the ten coins? All ten of them belong to the woman of the house, the lady of the house. When she loses one of them, she searches for it furiously until she locates it. And then when she does, she puts it back with the other nine. And it's properly a part of the ten coins. Then uh, she says to her friends and neighbors, quote, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which was lost, unquote, Luke 15, 9. Now the question is, which of the coins in this story, supposedly represent unbelievers. Are we going to say the nine represent unbelievers? And then the one is lost from the nine unbelievers and he's brought back to the nine unbelievers? That makes no sense. Well, is it the tenth one? Well, how can that one be an unbeliever when he was part of the ten to start with and then he was lost and brought back to the the other nine? Clearly they're a unit, they're a group, and the one that falls away was equally a part of them at the very beginning. None of the ten represent unbelievers, just as none of the hundred sheep represented unbelievers. Now, are we ready for the prodigal son? It should come as no surprise that in this story, as well uh, as the previous ones, the one who strays is a believer, not an unbeliever. The most obvious thing we can say about this young man is that he is a son. He's not a make-pretend son or a pseudo-son or a false-professing son. The text tells us he's a son of his father. He's even a son that's given an inheritance from his father. We cannot call this into question that he is legitimately a son of his father. He's not a spurious son. He's not a pretended son. He is a bona fide son. And just as the straying sheep already belonged to the flock, and just as the lost coin already belonged to the other nine coins, just so this boy was already a son of his father. He already belonged to the family of his father. So also, I might add, was the self-righteous older brother who refused to share his own father's joy in the return of his brother. Like all too many Christians, both in times past and today, he thought his father was too easy on this wandering son who has come back. The older brother thought, this kid ought to be dealt with more severely. Don't you? you know, slay the fatted calf for him and have a party. This one went away and squandered his inheritance. And the negative spirit of the older brother deprived him of a moment that would have been joyous for him and should have been joyous for him as well. It deprived the older brother of fellowship with his own father. Of course, all that I have just said is only a brief overview of this great chapter, but the data of the chapter is plain as can be. And this is all about Christian repentance, about those who already are sons, sheep, and coins. They're already in the fold, and they are repenting. They're making a decision to turn from their sins and get right with God. I've heard Zane say that our mutual friend, Luis Rodriguez, told him years ago that Luke 15 wasn't about 
the repentance of unbelievers, but it was about Christian repentance. And Zane points out that it's sad that it took him so many years to see the light. And I can tell you from my own experience that prior to hearing Zane teach on this, I thought the same way he did on Luke 15. And when I see it, the passage fits together perfectly. You know, in some ways, Bible study is like putting the jigsaw puzzle together, isn't it? If the pieces fit, it's beautiful. If you smash the pieces in where they don't belong, it's ugly. <laughs> and sometimes we try to do that with the Word of God. We know what we're saying is true. The fact that it's not found in the passage we're teaching should not bother us too much. <laughs> No, it needs to be found there. The pieces of the puzzle need to fit. If it doesn't fit, then we need to keep searching until we find God's intended meaning. No clever interpretive technique is required to see the facts I've just set before you on Luke 15. They're there for everyone to see. We should let the text speak for itself. Instead, we have been speaking our own thoughts and not those of the biblical passage. How could we have gotten it so wrong? Have you ever noticed that the passage on the prodigal son, how it's introduced in John's Gospel? As was pointed out earlier today, uh, the words that immediately precede it are found in Luke 14, 34, and 35. Jesus has just been giving some basic teaching on discipleship in Luke 14, 25 to 33. And then in verses 34 and 35, here's what he says. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how can it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It is noteworthy that in this text, unlike Matthew 5.13, our Lord does not explicitly say that the disciples should be like salt. But in context with the preceding discussion about discipleship, the discerning here is expected to recognize the connection. This is suggested by the words, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But the discerning reader might also ask this question. If this is what happens to ordinary salt when it loses its flavor, can a disciple be restored who loses his spiritual flavor? The answer is a surprise. What does not happen in the natural world with salt can happen in the spiritual world, in the spiritual realm. Spiritual salt can become flavorful again. How? Luke chapter 15. Christian repentance. The straying sheep can be brought back to the fold. The valuable coin can be brought back to the collection. The prodigal son can come home again. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't this a wonderful encouragement for the person who has strayed to get his flavor and his usefulness and his fellowship with God back again? And I want you to know something. This is something we have seen at Victor Street Bible Chapel over and over again. Zane has been there almost 45 years now. And he has seen many, many people who wandered away from the Lord and came back and have gotten back in fellowship with him. Saved people who strayed from the fold and stopped going to church and walked in the world and then came back and are now sitting with us in church and at the Lord's Supper. How could we have gotten it so wrong? Let me suggest that uh, briefly, in terms of repentance and Acts 2.38, a brief revisiting of Acts 2.38, let me suggest that in Acts 2.38, repentance is for fellowship forgiveness. It's interesting if we compare Peter's words in Acts 2.38 with Peter's words in Acts 10.43, we see some interesting things. In Acts 2.38, Peter says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But look at Acts 10, 43 and 44. 
to him referring to Jesus, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And then in verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then look at Acts 11:17 when he refers to the same incident. If therefore God gave them the same gift, he's referring to the gift of the Holy Spirit, as he gave us when we believed, who was I that I could withstand God? 